Hello, welcome to All Good Points. I'm Paul North. I'm George McBride. Who just, before it started recording, you just pointing out the new Coke. Have you tried this yet? The new uh, Coke Zero, Zero Sugar. Have you tried it? The new brand? Me? Yeah. <laughs> Me? Who else are you talking Me? <laughs> yeah, it's like... Um, no, I, I haven't tried it yet. I'm still, I'm still hooked Try up it. sugar. I'm still a sugar freak. I think this, I said it to Chris Snowden the other day, I had a catch up with Chris on Zoom and I said, have you, and he was like, a similar thing, he was like, why would I be trying zero sugar drinks? Like, what a ridiculous, yeah. what a ridiculous question. But I, I pressured him and I pressure you, do, do try it. It's actually really nice. Generally tastes like Coca-Cola. How are we doing, George? How's your week been? Yeah, yeah, good crack. Yours? It was rubbish. Do you know what's good, though? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it was rubbish and you're like i'm not bothered anyway go on what's good no 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 no, no, no. let's not talk, let's not talk about my my week but it's depressing you could talk about your week if you'd like to talk about your week but I, uh, no no let's 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 it was just a covid a funeral that was like covid funerals are pretty dire but on to bigger and better things what you got for me cheer me up i was just gonna say that hope well it feels really callous now but I, I hope, <laughs> hopefully this will be one of the last weeks where we'll be doing this with bad hair in our front rooms. Cause despite the fact that obviously yeah. someone close to you has died with COVID and this thing is far from over, we are close to being able to be well, back in the office mate. and filming and that kind of thing. Yeah. For this Thursday, me and G are going out and actually in pubs, actual drinks. We're nearly there. Man. So yeah, hopefully mate, hopefully, hopefully the next few weeks we'll actually, we'll be in the flesh. And we can get some real life people on the show with us, which would be fab, wouldn't it? Mm. And sorry about that very callous, callous behaviour. I totally forgot. What callous? No, it's Jerry. I find funny. Funeral yesterday. I thought you were just complaining <laughs> about like, oh, no, loads of people emailing me and calling me. No. no. <laughs> it's fine. Yeah, that too. But yeah, no, it's mm. all good. The, so a few, a few things that we want to talk about on today's show. One of them we kind of uh, touched on last week and then has kind of developed a bit in the past week. And that's the... The fears around big tobacco has been an ongoing discussion. I got into a lengthy Twitter discussion debate. Can you even can you even have Twitter debates? Twitter doesn't really work for debating, does it? Because it's so like you could basically say half a formed sentence before the other person starts. Like it's just mess. Anyway, um, there's an article in the Boston Globe. Big tobacco is coming for legal marijuana, and this sort of this is something we touched on the other week and it was that sort of like left wing fears around the tobacco industry, which, you know, we, I think we accepted last time we talked about this. It's an interesting discussion and an important discussion. Like regulation is clearly a really vital part of any proposed model of legalization, but the, the, the sort of fear factor is getting ramped up a little bit with regards to the big tobacco. And this article kind of epitomized that fear a little bit, didn't it? It did. Yeah. And it, I, what kind of so it didn't it shouldn't surprise me but it did was that lots of people i know just agreed with it straight away even though the one of the main propositions of the article was we shouldn't legalize federally until we can ensure that we're keeping big tobacco out and i didn't realize quite how for a lot of people they agree with that and i i just uh fundamentally don't agree with that as we discussed last time we were chatting about big tobacco on, it's, on all good it's kind, it's kind of scary isn't it because i guess what that argument is suggesting is that a legal model in which tobacco companies can operate is more harmful than the current system of prohibition which seems a ridiculously wild claim like that seem that seems a claim as bad as people that are pro you know pro pro prohibition and say, oh, if we legalize cannabis, a bit like Center for Social Justice, which recently Ant was debating the Center for Social Justice on, on another story that we'll talk about in a bit. But they're, they're, the basic premise of the social conservative argument around legalization of cannabis is if you do that, you will create chaos. It's like the chaos order argument, isn't it? It's like it's too, that freedom 
of, of choice by in a legal market would create too much chaos it's not worth it you, like our current system is better and this like we can only legalize when we've worked out a way to keep out corporations is that it's doing that same thing the, the well, it's ongoing a question civilization of, of, it's, it's, mad, actually, yeah. a mad, it's a mad thing what, what do people want are they trying to overthrow our system of you know a big corporate uh hegemony in the, around the world is that the aim of drug reform because the aim for me is to you know destigmatize drug users improve access to safer products you know avoid criminalizing people get rid of all of the racist problems not yeah. not you know try and end this you know the the power of big companies um yeah i the, the, one of the suggestions in the article was to limit the size of cannabis companies uh, and that seems to clearly be more about a fear generalized fear of large companies than it, it has to do with uh a fear about um big tobacco you know because that's yeah. a, that that would do far more than just remove big tobacco from the picture it would mean that successful business owners can't grow even when their products are really popular and people want to buy loads of them because you've just said no as soon as you get too big you're too dangerous and that's a problem but but a company that grows and gets bigger is growing and get bigger because people are buying the products because they like them or that you know they're cheaper or better or the service is better uh, and that's a good thing yeah my... i agree completely and and this is why it's this is what i find so painful about it and would describe it as like identity politics, like an identity politics way of debating and understanding the issue. It's just making huge sweeping statements and judgments. It's, it's basically what, what prohibitionists do, what social conservatives do of, on, on drug reform, is make very large sweeping statements that lack nuance, that don't accurately portray some of the benefits that exist for large corporations. Like large corporations could be huge employers full of people that have started off as small businesses and ended up being incredibly successful like that's like I, like you said that's nothing to do with tobacco those two things are completely separate like like someone say look tobacco which is a reasonable position a reasonable position in my mind is to say you know we know from the history of tobacco as a substance and the relationships that it's formed with co with governments that there are concerns and risks there that we need to mitigate right there are clear there's clearly been a history of issues and problems with regard to George, that noise is super loud by the way you do that thing you have to if you do it's, i think it's just a strength you just got very strong fingers <laughs> just as much lighter touch is required i think anger <clears throat> tobacco Tobacco. There's the, what I'm saying is there's a legitimate concern that exists around, you know, ensuring that there are systems of regulation to prevent companies pushing products and ideas which cause widespread social harm. But that is that to, to correlate those issues just broadly across um, all tobacco companies with cannabis seems like a bit of a stretch, es especially when cannabis is a completely different drug to tobacco. Like we're not talking about tobacco. We're talking about cannabis. Yeah. And like this is this is we're not we're not talking about tobacco as a drug. No, and nobody wants any well, but nobody apart from the people who who would you know benefit from it financially if they manage to do it. Nobody wants really to include harmful addictive chemicals that are added to cannabis. But you stop that by sensible regulation around what is and isn't allowed to go into yeah. products and safety testing and not yeah. just debarring anybody who's worked in the tobacco industry because of the wrongs of a very generalized group of people. Yeah. That's the thing I think that upsets me and, and you about it is that you're seeing all the harms of racist enforcement of drug laws, et cetera. And then you're seeing a, a, a group of people who participate in the in the tobacco industry and then just saying that all of them should be excluded indefinitely from any involvement in this new sector it's because so some of the bad stuff which some of them have done i just um, i just find that, the, that it winds me up so much that people actually think that if you work for a tobacco industry the tobacco industry you you naturally become or are more evil than other corporations like the tr this is why it's identity politics the truth of it is human beings run big corporations it's just humans it's people who are just as susceptible to making ill choices and poor choices and things that the public would disapprove of like 
regardless of the corporation like it, it's just so it's, it's just so simplistic to be like oh tobacco are the evil ones like i no. think like it's, a, it's way a helpful more complicated than that. a helpful analogy i think is if you take the green energy revolution which is going on at the same time as this kind of drug reform re revolution if you were to say that the uh, oil and gas industry can't participate in renewables because they've already, you know, <laughs> messed up everything because there was the deep horizon yeah. of all of these oil spills. So we just, none of that money is allowed to come in to this nice, newer, greener energy. And none of them are allowed to get involved because they've all, you know, they've had their go and they've wrecked it. That would be mad. That would stifle the growth of renewable energies and in the same way prohibiting all the money from tobacco and all the people who've been involved in selling tobacco from cannabis would just would just damage the cannabis industry um so yeah it's my, it's my, that's, such, that's such a good that is such a good point analogy but because that's a left-wing issue they're not going to say that do you know what I mean? Because like environmental reform is obviously important, and rightly so, important to a lot of liberals. They're not going to put, they're not, they're, they won't be saying those similar things. But when it comes to cannabis, it just seems, because there's a social justice element, I just feel like people push the argument um, as far as they can. And it's a conversation we were having, I think we might have had this conversation either prior to this or last week, is like, surely, surely the focus here is reducing the criminalization of vulnerable groups and, and reducing the harm that our illicit drug policies do. If that's the focus, then let's fo let, let's get policies that, that actually work, that are akin to the way in which we control and regulate other substances, rather than creating some fairyland type system of regulation, which doesn't exist in any other area, that starts to magically paint big corporations as the evil guys and over-egging the power of small businesses. Because like, what, what would be really good in a, in a regulated market is really good innovation like really good research and development that takes place, wide level of access, low cost so it's affordable for people, particularly vulnerable groups so they don't go to the illicit market, and lots of like, like an industry that's actually going to function and work. It's got to work. And the way to do that is to accept that you have, you know, you're going to have to have corporations of different sizes, and some of those are going to need to be fairly big corporations that can come in and have got the money to do the research off the bat. You know, because if you just said, let's limit it so it's just small companies, well, that's going to take years and years and years to get that level of innovation and research, to get the supply cost down, to create the jobs. Like, it's just such a simplistic way of looking at things to be like, well, the big corporations, particularly tobacco, they're the evil guys, but the small ones, they're all right. Well, where do you think big corporations start? It's the same thing. It's just smaller. This, the, and and guess, guess what? People that start small corporations, they think and work the same way as people that run big corporations. But a lot of these left-wing characters, and they're still identified just about on the left, they want to imagine that people that run corporations, they're the sort of evil, guy, evil white guys in suits. But if it's a small microbrew, you're a cool hipster and you're really friendly. It's just people. It's just people running corporations. And it is way more complicated than they're the bad guys they're the good guys and it's utterly infuriating that the argument gets taken to that simplistic way of looking at things rather than focusing on like meaningful sensible regulation that you could actually implement because as we've talked about before there's obviously obviously some really sensible things you can do to stop some of those those things happening that have happened with the bass with tobacco like testing you know that the character that wrote that article basically saying oh the tobacco industry will want to add dangerous additives and this that and the other first of all that's just fear mongering but second of all just implement sensible regulation so that for a product to hit market it has to go through testing which is what and, you know and then we that. do we do need those kind of like people pointing out potential problems and highlighting them and trying to you know propose sensible regulations to avert problems and that needs to keep happening because if big companies did get into power and then you know start pushing products which potentially were more ex addictive or less safe you want those regulations to come in but yeah they ca you can't just avoid that just by removing large companies from the picture no. and it's got to be fun we'll move on from it we're getting really wound up yeah you are i've never seen you so heated it, it, honestly mate left-wing identity politics is a, is a is a curse on anything sensible right honestly it's a it's a it's a, it's a dangerous curse and, and but what, what we need from a regulated market is something that is is fun it's got to work it's got to be good it, all this discussion that slides into this sort of identity politics bracket becomes for me very sort of like metropolitan liberal 
way of looking at things from an ivory tower when really on the ground for the average consumer of cannabis it's got to be a positive enjoyable good experience which to, to me would look like most of our markets you know what i mean like if i want to go buy some trainers or some clothes or alcohol god forbid then it's, it's quite a nice experience like, like going buying clothes is quite a nice experience in london it's enjoyable you can go in different shops you can see it you know like it's a positive experience and it's positive because it's regulated sensibly. Whereas if we get this sort of like, what we talked about that theme park world before, haven't we? You gave me this analogy. Where like theme park world, where like it's everything's steel and it's called theme park world. And it's like ride number one, ride number two. And it's all steel with loads of health warnings. I don't want to go to that theme park. I want to go to Walton Towers. Do you know what I mean? And that's the difference between like a really heavily regulated, boring model, which no one wants to go in, versus something that's fun. All right, well... Fun. To Shaleen Title and Andy Tan, who wrote the article, I now feel a bit sorry for you that we're accusing you of not letting Paul go to Alton Towers. So <laughs> if you end up seeing this, you, you probably don't even know what Alton Towers is, but it's nice. But <laughs> would welcome you on the show to argue this, because I know there are other points that we haven't raised, you know, and everyone's, you know, uh, arguing from a, from a you know... Th- thinking that they're out advocating what's best so yeah and, and to be clear i respect i respect anyone's view on this do you know what i mean I, i'm animated because i don't like people being harmed and it, i want i want something that works but like someone disagrees with me nothing but respect for them and so, like, so, uh, yeah, sorry go on. oh the, yeah. no just the other thing that i i was that triggered me a bit that i wanted to bring up about this as well was i was speaking to some journalists at the bbc doing a documentary and they were asking about the impacts and what people in the US don't understand is that the continued federal illegality of cannabis has a profound impact on cannabis users and cannabis laws all around the world. It stops banking from working. It's the main reason why the Uruguay system doesn't work properly. It's had these really pronounced impacts around the world. So to be like, well, we've got our nice little, you know, uh bespoke little tiny cannabis craft companies and we're fine so don't let big tobacco in is to also stop a wave of legalization all around the world so federal reform should be high on the agenda for people who actually want to have an impact on drug policy around the world not just settling on the state by state system they've got over there at the moment which i can see why some would want to but i i think it would be terrible for the rest of the world yeah i agree completely what, what me and Katja were chatting about this the other day, there was like a, maybe to summarise this as, as, as summarise this discussion up somewhat, is that what's really um, unique and interesting about drug reform is like we're kind of like at the acute end of the spectrum. So, so what, what I mean by that is drug reform as a subject has been so strongly dominated by the left. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing because the, the care harm principle is, is f- crucially and fundamentally what's got this on the agenda and why it's happening. Like it, is, it should have been, it should be a left wing issue in its early days, but it's now naturally evolving outside of that because reform, you know, well, it, well, it has to for, for reform to take place. But like we're at sort of the sharp end of, of, of that way of thinking ideology. So of all the areas that you could work in with regards to political reform or areas of reform, this is the one which is so heavily dominated by the left. So these arguments are going to be particularly difficult and, and, and heavy because most people, that's why you said most people agreed with that article. But that's because most people that passionate follow us, follow us on Twitter or whatever, engage, watch this show, like will naturally be left wing. So therefore naturally adopt frames which are, in essence, you know, anti-market, capitalism is bad, socialism is good, those sort of things. So that it makes these discussions for me even more important. Yeah. And it sounded scary. And I, if you were, if I, I was reading that article in an area that wasn't my area, I would maybe think, oh God, yeah, we, we can't let cannabis legalization carry on until they fix this. And I yeah. think a lot of people will have been persuaded by that. And I, I find that that's sad but then so this this argument isn't going anywhere this is going to be like the uh, dominant argument as this goes and the interesting new development is this um cannabis freedom alliance isn't it sorry you're supposed oh, yeah, to bring yeah. up the next news no no you go for it go for it i like it i like it. mix it up mix it up yeah so the, the uh, notoriously hated um figures by left-wing journalists are the Koch brothers who are industrialists magnates who are also 
you know, some say more influential than the Republican GOP itself in terms yeah. of, of conservative policy in the US. And they're also ardent uh, uh, libertarians. And they believe in the legalization of all drugs, uh, I think, um, yeah. but not just imagine. cannabis. But they also are aware of what's going on in terms of the narrative around stopping big business and have set up this Cannabis Freedom Alliance with the, the hope that they can push uh, a, a cross-party um, support for federal legalization by bringing the Republicans in on, on de Democratic-sponsored le le legislation. And I think that's fantastic, because like you were saying, for this to move on, it can't be a left-wing issue. You have to get some bipartisan support. And I personally was happy because... It, <laughs> Two kind of broad genres of people that I find quite interesting are gangster rappers and billionaire Lips. libertarians. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They're, they're, what an alliance! I, I like I like both of those types of people, to be honest. Uh, so <laughs> I was quite happy to see Snoop Dogg joining up with with them all this kind of <laughs> freedom alliance. Um, I think it's quite interesting bedfellows that the cannabis. Yeah, makes. yeah. First, Martha Stewart and, and Snoop Dogg at Canopy, who we've got a story about in a minute. And now Snoop Dogg and the cop brothers <laughs> fighting for the freedom of, of anyone to get involved in the cannabis industry, big or large. Big or like large, big or small. Big, big or large. And I, I, I agree with you as well that, like, that is, for me, that's, if, if you want to see meaningful reform that functions and works, the reality is you have to get on board those groups. Otherwise, you're going to end up either seeing nothing much beyond decriminalisation or the model that you do get implemented will be done so in such a restrictive way that it won't function. And, and I, I think this is why New Zealand failed, you know. First of all, I thought the campaign was bad and that it just fell into the same traps that a lot of campaigning does when it tries to engage in this issue. And that's not to be disrespectful to the people that do it because they're great people who, who I admire. But if, if I've got to be honest, I don't think, it, I don't think the campaign was framed um, correctly and i think that p played a big a big part in in why it didn't succeed yeah. i feel bad for going i feel bad for going to new zealand but I, I think one of the reasons that the referendum didn't go through is because a lot of people in new zealand are scared of cat of of carpets i mean <laughs> not carpets they're not scared of carpets. well they might be i don't think they're scared of, is they're scared they're scared, they're scared of carpets um, they're, they're scared of markets and capitalism. Yeah, and they then, you are. know they this are, idea are, that like, like, oh, it's going to get legalized, and then you know, uh, what what what's hilarious about the sort of lefty anti-capitalism uh, cannabis vibe is exactly the same frames are used by Kevin Sabet. Yeah, so he that was. That article he's written. He, he he'll he's... love that article. He'll be like, that's, that's a great article. Well, did, yeah, did, it's big tobacco. You just like. Did you see his tweet about it? He was like, no, I I uh, he tweeted it being like, they, they've they used the framing verbatim, word for word. This is what I've been saying. So this is the problem. You are playing into the hands of the likes of, of you know, uh, s sensible approaches to marijuana, i.e. Yeah. completely batshit approaches yeah. to marijuana. Uh, um, and th they love this. And then the yeah. problem you're going to have is if you've got the likes of Cock and Snoop Dogg saying that this should be, you know, open business, there shouldn't be restrictions on licenses, blah, blah, blah. Let's let companies go, go nuts. That Then the question is, will that bring more Republicans to support uh reform than it removes democrats because there might be a number of democrats then who actually you know uh vote against potential reforms because they think oh, i don't want to be yeah. on the side of those guys and they are quite you know um sectarian and tribal and yeah. th it might end up uh, going one way or the other and i, I don't know yeah. um it's it's, an, it's, 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 a, it's a very interesting question and it the, the whole thing it's the danger of nonsense policy is what I describe a lot of a lot of the stuff that people put forward. It's kind of like let's live in this magic utopia, where I don't know. Let, let's just envisage this magic utopia and then kind of fit a policy around that, rather than what actually happens in the real world. Because if I was Peter Hitchens, right, and I had a debate, let's say I, I, I was debating a, a classic sort of like drug pro legalization drug reformer, I would just adopt the big tobacco frame and basically just get them to agree with me. Because you, you basically be like, Peter Hitchens, if I was Peter Hitchens, I would say, I'm really worried about corporate takeover and big tobacco. 
right? I'm really worried about vulnerable groups being exploited by big tobacco and they've got a track record of being evil and, and that's all that's going to happen. And look, they've bought Organogram. And then the person debating will be like, yeah, that, yeah, I have those fears as well. And all Peter Hitchens needs to do is say, how are you going to stop big tobacco getting in then? And when they start answering in this waffly way of like, oh, we'll do background checks and this, that, which, which clearly would never work. Like, you, you, like it, it, then you, you, you just put the reformer in a position where they can't help but agree with you that like, yeah, we're not there yet. It's that, you know, because there is, no, there is no practical way to block out big business from uh, the, the cannabis market. But, but Peter Hitchens, much like Kevin Sabet, does already do that he he started attacking me for something i said on twitter and then i responded and then he called me a big dope shill and then blocked yeah. me <laughs> yeah. and and that 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 framing that big dope shill that that's like yeah. just just loaded with fear about the you know big to big tobacco 2.0 business you know it's that, painful, it's that painful thing that Chris Snowden gets that a lot of left liberals like to do, where it's kind of like, who funds you? As, as though like it's, it's such an insulting thing to ask someone because it's like, it's like your words and your message are meaningless. The only thing that matters is where you get your money from rather than engaging with what someone's actually saying. Do you know what I mean? You could make the most eloquent, powerful point and, they, and, and what they'll often do is go, who funds you? Or that's offensive. Both of which are like complete distractions from the content of the dialogue and discussion. It's a it's a fantastic argument technique is to tell someone that you, that you, they're f offensive. You've been yeah. you've offended. I'm offended now. I'm offended. That's offensive because you then it's taking the conversation into a realm that's completely like well, trying to make you feel bad and it, and it just distracts you from the actual like content of the chat. Anyway, yeah, it's ad hominem again, isn't it? Because you're saying to the person, yeah, you're you're mean. And then the conversation yeah, yeah. about the character of the individual rather than the content of the debate. Yeah. Which, yeah but it's not cool. It's not cool. Um, yeah. We got I'm I'm if anyone from the Cannabis Freedom Alliance is listening, <laughs> chat, um, I'm, I'm, I'm into it. Get us involved. Sign us up, lads. Yeah. Sign us up. There is a need that there is a need for that voice here in the UK with so many far left voices and think tanks like anti-capitalism voices there is a need for like center right arguments to be made like especially especially here, it's like it is loud that twitter is loud um uh, sadiq khan he's been a good lad uh, he said he'll review cannabis decriminalization if he's elected which is obviously going to happen sean bailey's not polling right like, it's <laughs> clearly going to be it's clearly going to be sadiq khan that uh, um, some of the race, racist narcissist, narcissist Lawrence Fox isn't going to win then. No. <laughs> <laughs> Good. No, he's he's definitely not. He's definitely not. Um, yeah, it's a bit cynical, this, isn't it? I think I think because he's been in power, and it's that classic thing where you're suddenly releasing this raft of things you're going to do if you're elected, which doesn't work. You can't stand on a reform platform if you're the incumbent. The only reason that he's able to pull off that kind of rubbish is because of the, how weak his opposition are. It was sad that Siobhan Bonita had to step down she was from great. race because she was great. She was brilliant. Um, Sean Bailey is all over the place. Sean it's, said some wild stuff about he's the testing. All thing. over the place, man. Oh. It's like I'm. I do worry sometimes about whether he's actually all there. To be honest, I've met. I've met Sean. I thought it was. I thought it was like. I thought it was. I thought it was all right. But then, it like, seems quite a nice guy, but and quite down to earth, and like you know, experience of working with young people. But when it comes to like a policy angle on the drugs area, he just goes. That policy proposal he had of testing people from firms and cities if they're taking drugs on a mall. I mean, you're going to lose half the city. <laughs> you can't. Literally half the law firms. and oh, you're like, undermine well, sorry, the whole we, yeah, we've lost infrastructure and fall apart. Yeah. Yeah. Can you imagine the HR teams? Oh, anyway. Nightmare. But yeah, I, I think you can be cynical about the Sadiq Khan thing, but also it is a good... The timing is unfortunate. It would have been nice if he'd engaged with people like us a few years ago when yeah, well, no, he did. It's, it's years of it though because like it all the, a lot of this i haven't read that article but a lot of this dialogue started with the um evening standard thing when we did the evening standard campaign and it you know it got got Khan into a position where like he said okay it's time to review it and i think it's Honestly. good it, it, with 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 starmer with starmer 
um, taking a bit of a back seat on the drugs issue. It's nice to have Sadiq Khan. Do you know what I mean? It's nice to have a Labour figure kind of saying, okay, we need to look at it, we need to review it. Cause... I, it is, because I actually think it could be massive. So the Ant wrote that article, and I, I put a quote in there, but people forget how important cities can be in all of this, because the whole yeah. wave of cannabis reform that we've seen in this modern era emanates from decisions made by city councils in California and other parts of the West Coast of the US. Because yeah. during the HIV AIDS uh, epidemic, cities and councils started coming together to say, we support people accessing medical cannabis, you know, for medical purposes, we support, you know, these patients trying to access this. And it created an environment where local communities came together to protect dispensaries and say, we want you. And it was only then through the existence of those dispensaries, which had been protected by their local community, that 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 then led to the state level reform in California, which then led to the creation yeah. of an industry and it spreading around the world. And so if you can, if yeah. we could actually get London to sign a completely non legally binding declaration to say, we support the decriminalization and legalization of cannabis, that's it. There's no legally binding, and and but you can tell that the, the conservatives are worried about it because Allegra Stratton, Boris's press secretary, came straight out afterwards and said, "Cannabis is an illicit substance and it's dangerous, and we have no plans to legalize it." Well, of course it's illicit. We all know that it's only illicit because you banned it. But yeah, anyway, yeah. thanks for that. Yeah. Thanks for that. Didn't really. No, we were not going to legalize cannabis because cannabis is banned. It's like, yeah, that's exactly what we're talking about. But they came at the fact that they felt the need to contradict that, I think actually shows that there was an element of fear there. Because if London was to come out and say that, you would start having loads more cannabis speakeasies, loads more, yeah. you know, informal, small, like open yeah. dealing. And then that would then create the kind of situation which led to the reform in Canada, where you have Justin Trudeau saying, this is mad. We've got dispensaries up and down high streets all over the place. We need proper regulation. Yeah. And, you know, I think it could have a profound effect if London came out and, and gave a symbolic statement. But my fear is that Sadiq is only saying it to encourage young people to come out and vote and that it's not actually much of a priority for him and that he's quite a cynical politician and he probably would drop it as soon as he won the election. But then maybe that's just me being a cynic. What do you think? I think, no, I think, I think there's truth in it, but also I think it's important to celebrate the fact that he has come out and said that when he could say a lot, he could have talked about like green energy. He could talk about the tube. Like there's just, there's just in London, there are just tons of things. He, could he did talk about. about the tube to be fair. Well, yeah, no, he always talks about the tube, but, but like, he, I think he came out with two policy, two, like, these are the two key things that I'm, I'm pushing forward. And like, for one of them to be cannabis and, and just cannabis, I think that's, I think that's, I think that's something to celebrate, even if it's hollow and it just leads to increased, because look at all the press and stuff that's come off the back of it. Like there's, there's been like two days of just like journalists writing articles and radio ho like the, the, any time something like this happens, you get this like big wave of just press. Like we've done a lot of press in the past couple of days that are just on just on cannabis, and that that I think I think even if it's just something he goes, no, it was just a vote winning, it's you know cynical take on it. Well, at least we've got some good press out of it. And and it, again, YouGov, YouGov did another poll, only thirty two percent oppose cannabis legalization. That's amazing. That's incredible. That's incredible. So only thirty two percent of the population agree with the Centre for Social Justice and Peter Hitchens. What an undefensible policy position if put forward by a politician. Like, and, and every single age category now is pro other than the like 65 plus, which is fine. They, they're always going to be against. They're stressed out. They don't really understand cannabis, a generation that doesn't really uh, get well, it. Well, I, I think that that demographic too would be in favour of support if we had a properly functioning medical system with high levels of access, because we've seen that happen in the US. As soon yeah. as the, 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 you know, the older generation have decent access to cannabis, the use starts going through the roof and they start di they stop stop they using so many benzos, they stop using they like the opiates, yeah. they stop drinking so much wine, yeah. they feel better, and then they start thinking, 
well, maybe you don't need to have severe intractable epilepsy and a prescription from your doctor before you give this a go. Um, maybe you should be able to go to a shop if you've got a bad back or, you know, yeah. um, and, yeah, and that, agree that's happened and that they would shift if it, I, I and, and that, that's the target, that George, isn't it? If you know that that's the, for, for me, the, the a really sensible adult use campaign would would give some really good case studies and voices to that age group to basically feed back to them and be like, this has been amazing for my arthritis. This has been amazing for my back condition. Do you know what I mean? And, and show, because you're absolutely right that the reason that they vote against it is they think of cannabis as kind of like someone smoking a really long, strong joint. They don't think of it as a cream or a balm that can help with muscle pain, arthritis, et cetera, et cetera. So like that, but th this is why it will happen in the UK because me and you know from seeing these markets in North America and from the work that we do, that it works. And it like it, it's not a myth, it's not a fallacy. Like it's well, just a case of pointing out to them. I, I've just been triggered by somebody sharing oh, no. a Times article from today, which I haven't read yet, but the headline. It, but it, oh, is, it, it, is it James, it James Forsyth? Yeah, apparently saying that the that, that legalization of cannabis in other countries hasn't worked. And I'm, I'm I'm hearing this a lot more at the moment as well. And and I don't understand where this is coming from. People seem to think that the bar for success for the cannabis industry is completely eradicating the black market, solving organized crime, completely eradicating youth use of cannabis. And you're like, what on earth? Like this is part yeah. of my problem with the anti big corporate sentiment. Legalizing cannabis isn't a panacea in the same way that cannabis isn't a panacea itself. But it's yeah. evidently the better policy. Like you'll see marginal improvements across a range of different things, as well as hundreds of thousands of jobs created and significant tax revenue. Yeah. In what way has it not worked? The only country I can think of where cannabis legalization hasn't worked is Uruguay. And part Uruguay. of it is due yeah. to the statist oh. model, which has completely yeah. limited job creation in the sector because there are so few companies licensed and they have to supply through existing pharmacies and what have you. So you haven't had the job creation around dispensaries and coffee shops and craft producers and marketeers and salespeople and events and all the other cool stuff you can do. So it, I would say that the only reason that it hasn't worked is it hasn't been done in your yeah. quite, you know, they didn't legalize it properly. Yeah. And ironically, that's the model that a lot of social justice warriors will push <laughs> is the kind of like, I trust government more than I do evil corporations. Let's put it in the hands of government and have a heavily restricted model anyway. Yeah, I feel like this <laughs> is like that one. becoming me and you just like beating social justice it's, warriors with a stick. It's, but, it's oh. Hey, listen, no, listen, I, I, let, me, let me be clear. There's some really important frames that come out of social justice with regards to drugs that me and you have time after time after time openly supported. We absolutely do not support the over-criminalisation of people from BME communities, the over-representation of them in prison and for drug-related offences. Me and you find that offensive. It's wrong. It has to stop. But that's why we care about this. That's what like I, I care about this because I saw for years how damaging our drug policies are. It's abhorrent. It's horrible. It's not a nice thing to see. But the end result has to be something that works. And we have to lift up our, our blinkers of our own ideology and be like, what does the world look like? What's actually feasible? Rather than living in Alice, you know, asking going asking going to Narnia and asking the yeah. the lion, what the what model of cannabis, you know, just let's keep it real. I think part part of what's pissed me off about people keep saying, oh, it hasn't worked or, you know, which pe which people are saying across the board. And now there's an article in The Times saying it, um, which is just wholly untrue. But part of it as well is this perverse sense that the burden of proof for cannabis legalization should be on the reformers when cannabis was only banned in the first place out of sheer ignorance, racism and protectionism. There was no notion of it being done for the protection of people's health and well-being. That wasn't what it was about at all. So yeah. the idea that we now have to take the status quo as the status quo and then prove why we should be allowed to deviate from that rather than saying this is racist, unjust, terrible economic policy, terrible social policy and just that it should be changed but we 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 need you know the bar of evidence is ridiculous in switzerland where there's yeah. over 70 percent support for full cannabis legalization and everybody 
smoke it's very 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 prolific cannabis use in switzerland they're having to do this these trials with up to five thousand people in each city or canton and then there has to be this like 10 year public health assessment of the impact of it and you know and that frustrates me i like i'm happy that there's all this evidence coming out but you're gonna we're gonna wait 10 years and then i guarantee i guarantee at the end of it the, the results will have been positive but through that whole 10 years what's the biggest negative outcome you didn't let anybody else in on the scheme. Everyone else has still been giving their money to criminals, buying inferior quality products, not paying any tax. Like it's a shit, it's a shit yeah, it's system a shit. when you have to yeah. prove yeah. That, that, that cannabis legalization is, is the right choice. It, when it's so evident that the current status quo is from, you know, ignorance, racism and, and nonsense. Yeah, I agree completely, George. That's a, that's a cracker of a point. Just don't forget that, uh, that big criminals aren't the real bad guys. It's corporations we've got to be worried about. Don't worry about human trafficking, slavery, crime. They're, they're, they're you know, it's corporations, mate. They're the real danger. Yeah, that's it, man. God, that was over half an hour. Sorry, everyone. Thanks for watching. <laughs> All good rants. We should do it more on a Friday. <laughs> Yeah, because we get really stuck. We normally do it really early in the week, and we're like, "Oh yeah, what's going on? Yeah, you're all right, mate. You're all right. Do it on a Friday. Give me a oh. give me a funeral. Give me a funeral on a Friday, and I'll get fired up." <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Well, thanks for joining us, George. We failed to cover all the stories, but I think we've got across what we wanted to get across. We covered the main bits. I didn't get to point out. Happy bought Supreme. Oh, they call you hemp. Yeah, I've got the most cannabis I've ever had. None of it <laughs> good for smoking. That is a lot of cannabis. <laughs> That's a lot, isn't it? What are you building? A uh, new office in the out in the garden. Oh, nice. Yeah, nice. For, uh, for everyone, can I come work there? You can come work there now and again. Um, yeah, it's going to be lovely. It's going to be made of cannabis, and I'm going to have opium poppies growing on the roof. And if the Home Office want to come and arrest me for having a few opium poppies on my roof, come at me, bruh. Come at me, bruh. <laughs> we'll edit that out, don't worry. No, no you won't. No, you won't. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Okay, maybe I'll work on after it gets busted and you remove the puppies. <laughs> <laughs> if if we, right. rest someone for growing flowers, man, that's the thing, you know. I, I am still it's just very, a plant. It's just it's a, plant. a flower for it's God's sake. Um, yeah. Anyway, Wicked. That was all right. Well, in sorry, enjoy, sorry, enjoy audience. It was fine. Wicked. All right. Thanks for watching, everyone. We'll catch you next time. <laughs> We'll